chapter 13, we'll just read one verse. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Let's read it together one more time. The count of three. One, two, three. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. He's still the same, folks. Boys and girls for Junior Church, you may dismiss at this time. All the boys and girls, you can go to Junior Church and our workers are going to be a blessing to you. Follow Miss Sandy to the fellowship hall and she's got a wonderful lesson prepared. I thank God for our workers and what a blessing. The Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And so I was thinking about as I was going to preach this this morning which direction I was going to head and so I thought of the past I thought of the present and I thought of the future and and I believe that there are some things that I'm going to speak about this morning that will resonate in you in relation to who Jesus Christ is first of all <clears throat> he's still the same when man sins He's still the same when man sins. If you'll turn to Genesis chapter 4, the book of Gen actually Genesis chapter 3. When we're not right with the Lord and we're away from God, God still shows up. He's still ever present. But He is not affected by us because he is holy he is always the same and it doesn't matter when man sins he remains the same and we better be thankful that he is the same because it's his holiness that is his most significant trait Isaiah said I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and then he said, I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean clean lips. And mine eyes have seen the King, the, the, Lord, the, the, the Lord, the King of glory. And he said, he heard the angels say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. By the way, go to the book of Revelation and listen to the cry of the four beasts. Isaiah heard, holy, 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 and the cry and the overtone of heaven is, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. He's still the same. He was the same before the worlds were made. He was the same when the worlds were made. He was the same when the world sinned. And so verse 4, or verse number 1 of chapter 3, we have the story of Adam and Eve. Adam chose to sin in verses 1 to 5. Uh, verses 1 to 6, it says, and When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. Now he knew what was going on. She was deceived, the Bible says in the New Testament, she was in the transgression. She was deceived, but was in the transgression. But Adam willingly sinned against God. And that's why Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. But I want you to see where God was when man sinned. He's still the same. In verse number 8, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? 
And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, and so forth. But here's how God is still the same. He knew man had sinned. But he showed up to his appointment. God's presence is always available, always available to the lost who will come to Christ and to the saved who know Christ. The problem is, is we most of the time don't show up, or a lot of the time we don't show up. The lost aren't looking for it. Okay? They're just not into it. You know, God and I, we, you know, we just have this thing. I've always, I've always wondered what this thing is. I, I think the description of this thing is whenever I need him, I'll call him, and right now, I have no need to. I got everything under control. And then, boom, something happens. But the Bible tells us in Proverbs 1, when God calls and no man regards, that then at that point, God turns us over to ourselves and he lets it take its course God is still the same when we sin he's still the same in his grace and we can be thankful for his grace we are saved by grace through faith and the Bible says, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you in this room, anyone in this room thinks they're going to get to God or get to heaven through their own human strength or through religion, through doing any kind of human work, uh, you're, you're not ever going to, you're not going to get even to first base with that. Because you're, you, all your works are tainted by sin, and all mine are too. We must come through God's grace. It's only by His grace that He allows us to be saved. And so He's still the same with His grace. His grace was given to all. Now let me say that again. His grace was given to all. God was not selective with His grace. Now nothing said about this by the Calvinists. God didn't give irresistible grace. He gave free grace to the world. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Last I checked, the world means everybody. Amen. It means everybody. And so God's grace is not selective. There are many religions that are selective. Christianity is one that is open. And it's through Jesus. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The life means eternal life. The life means spiritual life. Without the life, you have no salvation. Without the truth, you have no salvation. Without the way to get to God, you have no salvation. And salvation is only through Jesus. And by grace, He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He's still the same with His grace. Still saving sinners today. He's not shut his, shut his heart out. Every person who is lost has an opportunity to come to Christ if they will avail themselves to it. It's hard for those of us who know the Lord and have been saved uh, for many years. I will celebrate this next week. I will celebrate 42 years of knowing Christ. I'm very thankful for that. December 9th, 1973, at 14 years of age, I asked Jesus Christ into my life. And I've never regretted a day. Being saved 
Knowing Christ, experiencing his, his grace is amazing. He's still the same. He's still the same with his mercy. Mercy is him withholding that which we don't deserve. Grace is giving us that which we don't deserve. And that's why the Bible says God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says his mercies are what? Everlasting. So he's still the same. He was merciful in the beginning of time. He was merciful in the middle of time. And he will be continuing to be merciful until, until the end of time, until eternity begins for us as God's people. He's still the same. And thank God, he's still the same. He's still the same when man sins. Secondly, he's still the same when the world becomes corrupt. When the world becomes corrupt, it's amazing how Christian people, saved people, believing people, Old and New Testament, turn away from God. But God remains the same. He doesn't change. When the world becomes corrupt, <clears throat> God remains a constant. And so he said to Noah in Genesis chapter 6, and you can turn to that story and read it later. Genesis chapter 6, he, says, he said to Noah that the world has, uh, the, the imaginations of every man's heart is uh, it's continually upon evil. And I'm going to destroy the world with a flood. So he said, get an ark built. He gave him the design. He gave him the materials. And they set out on a track to build this ship that was 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, with three stories and a window on the top. And it was just probably mostly his family. Maybe there were some people that were his friends, I don't know, who started out, but then when they found out what he was building and why he was building it and where he was building it out in the middle of nowhere and then he was telling them that it was going to rain and they had never seen rain and, and they were thinking he was a fool probably by the end it was just his family just his sons and his wife and Noah but they got it built for 120 years God told Noah to preach he's called in, in the New Testament a preacher of righteousness he preached that God was going to send judgment, that God was going to send a flood. And the whole world rejected that message, and yet God remained the same. God could have changed his rules. He could have softened what he intended to do with man, and he could have opened it up for exceptions. But he didn't, because... God remains the same. He's a God of judgment. And he is a God that's holy. The ark was a picture of Christ as well. It was a picture of a person coming into the ark for safety and being saved from the floods, the overwhelming floods and we are overwhelmed or over flooded by our sin, folks. And because of Christ, because of Jesus, because of the fact <clears throat> that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, when the world becomes corrupt, we need to remain the same as God remains the same as believers. You see, when, when man sins, the tendency for us is to get soft because we want to maintain a relationship. I believe in maintaining relationships and keeping people close, but not at the expense of compromising what you believe and what I believe in sin. And I also believe, when the world becomes corrupt, that just as God remains the same, we as believers in our own personal life and in our stand remain the same. When my wife and I were gone uh, last week and we were out in Connecticut, it was refreshing to go to a church and hear a pastor, a friend of mine, Brother McNally, 
preach a message and stick with the truth and that everything was the same. Good music, solid message, loving congregation. We felt like we were home. We felt like we were here. And it was a blessing. But that's not becoming easy anymore. Because when the world has changed, the world becomes corrupt, the church has moved its position. He's still the same. Churches can do whatever they want to do. Pastors can do whatever they want to do. They are going to be subject to the judgment of God. But he's still the same. He has never changed. And so we as churches need to remain the same. We need to stick with the good word of God. We need to preach the truth. We need to stick with, I believe that the traditional conservative music. You say, why? Because it's holy. This is not to be a stage show. This is not to be a concert. We're not entertaining people. It's a holy place. When you get to heaven, you're going to be awfully surprised. And all those people that are in the contemporary movement are going to be awfully surprised when they get there. You know what, though? God will change their boredom. And God will change their heart. And they'll realize that they're in a place that is much different than the atmosphere that most churches have today. When man sins, God is still the same. When the world becomes corrupt and it goes in directions and it condones things that God does not condone, God remains the same and so should God's people. When men lose faith, he remains the same. Turn to Numbers chapter 13. God is not diminished by our lack of faith. In Numbers 13, and beginning in verse 30, we have the story of <clears throat> the children of Israel spying out the land and the report that com comes back from Joshua and Caleb and then the other ten spies. Beginning in verse 30, the Bible says, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole con congregation, said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wil this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? Oh, how much they had forgotten. They didn't have it good in Egypt. Folks, if they would have stayed in Egypt, they would have died in Egypt too. God delivered them from Egypt to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, but they had no faith. And beginning in verse 5, it says, And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the, the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we, put, which we pass through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. 
and the Lord is with us, fear them not. But all the congregation bade, stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a great nation and mightier than they. And of course Moses says, No God, you can't do that. Based upon your word, this is what you are bound by. God remained the same. It doesn't matter what generation it is. Generations past, this present generation, or any future generation, when men lose faith, he's still the same because he never doubts his power. He knows who he is. He knows his power, and he knows what he can do. But he is disheartened when somebody disbelieves. He remains the same. When man sins, he's still the same. When the world becomes corrupt, he's still the same. He's never corrupt. He never sins. When men lose faith, he remains the same because he knows who he is. And that's why he says to have faith. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He's the only one that can reward us for faith. And we need to have faith. In this generation, more than, more than before, we as a generation that is right in the middle of maybe the coming and the return of Jesus Christ, we need to have faith and trust that God's going to keep His Word, that God is coming, He's doing what He promised, and that He still can save. The fourth thing, when men reject Jesus, He's still the same. John 1.12, if you'll turn there, in the book of John, chapter 1, and verse 12. Referencing in verse 10, and verse, actually verse from verse 9, and we'll read down to verse 12. It says, this was that, that was that true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Uh, the fact is, is there are a lot of people in this world who still don't know him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. That was the, those were the Jewish people. They rejected him. But as many as received him, in any generation, generations past, generations of today, or generations in the future, any generation, any man, any woman, every boy, any girl, who is willing to trust Jesus Christ, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood. You're not, born in, you're not born saved into a family that's a Christian family. I'm sorry. You don't, get, you don't get to heaven that way. I am not going to heaven because I'm related to my mother and my father who trusted Christ when I was 12. Two years later, when I asked Jesus Christ into my heart after my dad got saved, that's when I became a son of God. It's as many as received him. We're not born of blood, nor the will of the flesh, but of God. John 3, Jesus made this statement. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. We're born physically, but we must be born spiritually. And the only way to be born spiritually is by receiving Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's it. And thank God, He remains the same, even in spite of rejection. I don't know about you, but I don't like rejection. I don't know of anybody in this room who likes to be rejected. 
We all want to be received. God would rather us receive Christ. He would rather every, every person out there receive Christ. That is why he has extended the olive branch. He has reached out his hand and his message is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You trust my son, I'll, I'll save you and I'll give you eternal life. And he's given, he's given an open invitation to everyone. But because men reject him, he's still the same. He hasn't changed his message. He hasn't changed his offer. Whosoever will may come. And you know, he will wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, hoping at the very end that that person will receive Christ. And, be, and we can be thankful for that. He, he's still the same. Because that's why the thief on the cross was given grace. When Jesus said today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Folks, don't give up on your lost loved ones. Don't give up on your lost friends. Don't give up on your lost co-workers. He's still the same. He can bring things into people's life and do things in people's lives to draw them and bring them close where they'll open their hearts to Christ. You keep praying, you keep, keep preaching, and you keep showing your testimony before those that are lost. And then finally, in conclusion, he's still the same when churches change. Go to Revelation chapter 2 and 3. The book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. In Revelation 2 and 3, at the very beginning of the book of Revelation, there are many in seminaries and Bible colleges that have taught <clears throat> that these two texts relate to time periods. I went through all those classes, I heard all that stuff, but when I've read scripture, I don't see it. Because in the book of Revelation there is a statement that is made in the very first chapter. Write the things which thou hast seen, and what he had just seen after that verse was written was the vision of Christ in chapter 1. The things that are, which are chapters 2 and 3, he writes in the present tense to them in these chapters. And then he says, and the things which shall be hereafter. Those are chapters 4 to verse 22. So chapters 2 and 3, he is going down through every church as the candlestick of each church and he is writing to the angel of the church which is always the pastor the man of God of the ministry the angel word angel is a word which means messenger and in every context that you read that word you need to understand it to mean messenger it is not an English word, it is, a, it is a transliteration of a word, which means they took a Greek letter, to an English letter to a Greek letter, and they made a word, angelos, which is put in English as angel, but it means messenger. The messenger of the church is a pastor. And so God calls men of God, and so he writes to the pastor of the church of Ephesus, under the angel, note it's singular, it's not plural. Under the angel of the church, write, These things, saith he, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Who's that? Jesus. Who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The seven golden candlesticks were the seven churches he's writing to. Who's that? Jesus. I know thy works, I know, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are, and, has, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for the, my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Had they changed? Oh, yes. They had their first love when they were first established. But now they've changed. Folks, when churches change, he remains the same. He's still the same. 
and he walks up and down the aisles of every church, every church this morning that's preaching the gospel, every pastor who's preaching the truth, preaching the word of God, the Holy Spirit, which was sent by Christ to indwell every believer, he is the one who was the comforter. He goes up and down the aisles and he convicts those and convinces those of sin and the changes that need to be made in their hearts so that the church can be like he is. They can be the same as God. We don't have to be the same as every other church. Ephesians 4 says that there are differences of a, a diverse administrations and they're different, they're different structures, different functions. And every church has different people and every church is from different areas. But he remains the same and we must as churches be biblical churches that preach this book which has never changed or ever will change. Thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. He's still the same. Jesus Christ is referred to in John 1 as the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word God was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then it says in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now listen to this statement. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That is exactly who he was before creation ever started. He has always been the same. He has always been like the Father. And the Son has always been like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's always been like the Father. The Father like the Holy Spirit. The Father like the Son. Triune Godhead. One God. Three persons. He's the same. And when churches change, God's not happy about it. And God speaks to churches about it. We don't have time to go through every church. But if you go through the churches, almost every one of them had something that God wanted changed. And by the way, we're without exception. You know your heart, I know my heart. And we need to ask God, help me to be the same. Before we close an invitation, I'm going to ask Mark to play some music in just a moment as we start the invitation. During the invitation, here's the question I want you to ask. I want you to go back and I want you to think about when you got saved and you trusted Christ. And I want you to, I want you to think back of the fervency that you had and the desires that you had and the commitment that you had and the difference in your life that you had when you got saved. And then I want you to ask yourself the question, am I still the same? I'm not talking about being perfect, but I'm asking you to think about where you are right now as opposed to what you were and what you need to become based upon who God is. The Bible says in John or Matthew 5, verse 48, Jesus was preaching the great Sermon on the Mount. And he made an astounding statement. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And let me say this. Until you and I are perfect, there needs to be constant change. So what that means is, is we are, we, we are always to be changing. Not to be like someone else, but to be like him. Because he's still the same. Our Father, we thank you for this morning. Let's